kind of advice do you have to homeowners? Practicing that preparedness. Starting the conversation now is always going to be a benefit to any association out there. And welcome to the Recovery Report Live, Global Pro's deep dive into relevant business and insurance topics, providing actionable takeaways and valuable insights. We aim to update, educate, and inform you weekly. I'm Dan Odess, president of Global Pro, where we manage risk to recovery. For more than a decade, we have represented thousands of business owners and community associations in the placement of insurance and the recovery from more than a billion dollars worth of loss. We are your source for insurance news you can use. Well, I'm joined here today with Vice President of Mueller & Associates, Mr. William Plaza. Mueller & Associates is a full-service structural engineering firm providing structural analysis and design services for new construction renovations and structural building modifications. William attended the Illinois Institute of Technology where he graduated with a master's in construction management. William... You have quite the diverse background, Uh, certainly uh, goes beyond just construction. You've managed many construction projects as well as a vast portfolio of major properties here in South Florida, and now vice president of an engineering firm. So welcome, William. Tell us a little bit about your transition from construction to property management to engineering, and what is Mueller & Associates all about? Well, Dan, thank you. First and foremost, good morning. Uh, thank you for having us on your webcast. It's definitely a pleasure to um, to be here and to certainly talk about all these very um, important matters that matter to our clients, right? So let me tell you a little bit about myself for everyone that's on the webcast and our firm. Um, so a little bit of background transition from construction. I started back um, in 2010, early in Chicago, doing new construction, as you mentioned. Uh, worked for a developer on the south and west side of Chicago, predominantly also downtown, the new construction mainly um, high rises and also we did a little bit of low income housing, some work there for the government that Ida HUD um, backed properties, did that for a few years, did some mixed use properties from the ground up. Um, but naturally once the, the recession unfortunately happened and the, the consequential effects of that recession, construction slowed down a little bit and I, I made a decision to venture into the property management world, right? So and now that I know how to build buildings, I wanted to perfect the management of them and understand what it takes to maintain them, to keep them up and um, to keep down the buildings operating. So I decided to make the move. I managed a few high rise condominiums in Chicago, uh, moved on to also doing some portfolio work with a couple of properties up um, again in Chicago. And um, I put together a plan. I wanted to um, naturally go back to construction, go back to construction management, which is what um, I was originally, um, my career path was, but, and so I decided to look into what, what areas of in, within the United States, um, are different when it comes to construction that were not so affected by the recession, right? Natural South Florida, Miami, as you may know, and, and everyone, um, that's part of the, the webcast, Miami has its own economy, right? So it's, uh, it has a huge influence when it comes to foreign foreign money, foreign investors. So construction did slow down, but not as much as everywhere else in, in the United States. So I decided to move down here, um, continue on with property management. I joined a, um, a residential management firm and worked for them in the capacity of regional director. I also oversaw several properties, high-end properties, and got to know the market. But eventually, um, within the, um, the last two years, I, I wanted to go back to construction. Um, met my partner, Mr. Helmut Mueller, and decided to go back into um, engineering construction. My partner is a structural engineer, and, and naturally with my background in construction management, we decided to join forces and um, partner up and open up a, um, a construction management division alongside with the structural engineering division of the company. So that's, so, that's uh, where I am today. <laughs> so, so it wasn't just the warm weather is what you're trying to say. What brought you from uh, Chicago down here? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, that was one of the uh, benefits. Uh, um, as you know, I, I relocated from the, uh, the Northeast down here and, uh, um, it made a similar transition. Um, uh, but went from construction to insurance, obviously you went, um, 
construction and management to uh, to engineering. So uh, similar path, uh, you know, studied a little bit of construction management masters as well. Unfortunately, I haven't finished that yet, but we'll we're, we'll continue to work on that one day. Um, you know, today uh, the real focus is on construction related losses and investigations. Something I know your firm does quite a bit about, um, or quite a bit of, um, and you know quite a bit about. Um, we have worked closely on a number of issues um, while you were a property manager. Um, now that you're looking at things from a different perspective as an engineering firm, what are the biggest missteps property managers make when handling a construction related issue that occurs on site? So th- that's an excellent question. Um, I, what I would like to mention is the, the biggest, the biggest misstep as a property manager is usually thinking that it's not, it's not a, a, a major issue that can be resolved um, in house. Right. If something happens and it's construction related, you should always get professionals involved. Structures themselves have there are many moving parts. You can't just put a bandaid on it and expect it to to just go away. Right. So missteps when it comes to handling construction related issues is not getting the, the proper parties involved. Right. Either an engineer to investigate, to assess and to provide um, an opinion on what is you know what the cost is. And then naturally after that, de- details on how to address it. And if it's something related to insurance, to involve the right parties, such as um, a claim adjuster, a, a public adjuster, such as yourself, to be able to recover properly, as uh, most of these properties, if not all of them, especially condominiums, have insurance policies in place, right? If you just put a Band-Aid on and close it up and not really keep the issue exposed, you run the risk of um, losing recovery, right? So a lot of that happens, unfortunately. And then you try to go after the fact that years later, say, oh, well, maybe you have a claim, maybe you have an issue. This is something that, that can be, uh, that we may have, um, we, we could get recovery from, but it's sometimes it's too late. And the, um, as you and I both know, the, uh, the insurance companies will say, well, if we're not given an opportunity to inspect, to assess the condition, to assess the amount of damages, how can you expect us to, to pay, right? It's not, it's not fair for anybody. So that's, that's a misstep that property managers make when handling a construction lady issue on site. The biggest one I see, is not getting the right people involved in, in, in trying to address it, which is, I understand, right? As a former property manager, you want to be a doer, you want to address the issue, and you want to make sure that you keep the client happy and you provide them with a solution right away. But sometimes it pays to wait, even if it's an inconvenience, um, as, as long as you're explaining to the community that there's a process in place that will, um, that will be beneficial, not just to the community, but to their pocket as well. And, and, you're, and you're coming from a perspective of working in uh, the property management industry. Um, you're also a board member uh, for a major community association here in South Florida. So you've had that experience of both working as the professional, uh, guiding a board, um, as well as making those, this, those important fiduciary decisions as a board member. Um, and now your, your firm is being retained to actually, as that expert, as that professional services. Yeah, we see a lot on our side, which um, you're, <laughs> that you've been involved in sometimes where, um, you know, the, the, the boards are out for blood uh, and, and it really becomes like a personal battle. And we kind of have to, you know, strip that away, look at the facts. How can we best serve the financial interest of all of our unit owners? Who do we need to get involved? And and the and, and a really important point to drive home whenever I talk about construction is that there's many steps you can take to understand your damages and your potential for recovery before you launch into litigation. So talk, I want to walk through a little bit about the investigation process. How does your investigation of a loss that occurs um, from an on-site construction differ from damages that are caused by something off-site, like a nearby building, such as like like concrete overspray. So you have like a broken pipe on property from let's say a mechanical contractor, and then you have concrete overspray or a, or a crane from a neighboring project falls on your building. How does your investigation uh, as an engineering firm change or different from one to the other? So investigation, the investigation process is very, um, is very specific. And what I mean by that, it depends on the type of um, the type of issue. As you mentioned, if it's on site, if it's a construction uh, related issue on site, for example, the example you gave of a broken pipe, right? Internally, you handle it with the with the parties involved. If you know it's a contractor, what the issue is, what's affecting, we go in, we investigate, and we provide uh, repair details for for that specific issue. We talk to the appropriate parties with management, with the board, and we we provide a mitigation plan. And also, naturally, we um, we let them know that they have to put their insurance company in notice, get somebody involved for the recovery process. But that's it's a, a simpler process altogether than offsite 
um, construction related issues. The example that you gave as far as concrete overspray, that's a very complex um, type of claim or type of issue, mainly because as you know, there are many, many um, projects going on right now. So let's say there's a building, an existing building, and there are three buildings being built simultaneously. So which one is the one that caused the, um, you know, the damages or where's the concrete coming from? So there's a lot of investigation needs to happen, a lot of coordination, uh, a lot of partnering up with, um, let's say a firm like, your, like yours, and a lot of timing that's involved with that. And, um, and, and again, to be able to determine what the cause and also you know, what defects are on the actual property and you know, what, what the next steps are. But from an engineering standpoint, there are a lot of things that, that um, need to happen as far as you know, documentation, a review of drawings, plans, specifications, um, you know, what's, what's are existing, whether or not that's, you know, the, those systems, let's say a window system is, is still being manufactured, it's been discontinued, if, you know, railing, if, whether your railing, railings are aluminum or they're, you know, any other type of product, if the paint was affected, there are many, many moving factors. So offsite claims are a lot more complex um, than onsite. Onsite are, you know, usually pretty, pretty simple to address, which again, should not be seen, seemed as easy to fix, but naturally they, they, they're different. So you and I want to for both have somebody involved. And I want to emphasize one thing and a very important part that, uh, of the uh, claims process in any time that you experience damage, which you mentioned documenting, right? And you, then you talked about the various documentation that you would need to uh, um, procure or create in order to substantiate those claims. And I think it's something that a lot of people miss when they launch into that litigation um, uh, phase of the of the of the process way too early and most often not even necessary and cost themselves a lot of money. So they go to the attorney, they start with the retainers, the hourlies, and then they go to the engineers, they go to the adjusters like ourselves, a global pro to then start an investigation to determine the scope or cause and the issues. And it's like, well, wait, you've already gone in the wrong direction. You've already cost yourself money. So there is an alternatives and it all starts with documentation and, and to determining not only the causation, but scope of work damages and amount of it. And, and, and I think it's a very important uh, point to emphasize and something you certainly you just addressed there. So let's talk about the leading causes of damages and walk us through your actual process. Um, and how does your process differ from what we would typically see from other engineering firms that let's say focus on, you know, construction defects or this 558 litigation. Um, I like, I, I always, I love hearing when people call it 558 claims and I'm like, well, no, that's a Florida statute. Um, and that's, that's most often associated with a, a lawsuit, not an actual claims process. Um, despite the fact that um, in a lot of situations, insurance companies are what? They're defending and paying these things. And had you engaged in an actual adjustment process, you could avoid um, a lot of the costs associated with the litigation, if, if not eradicate all of them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, leading causes. Talk to us, walk us through your process. Like, hey, I need an engineer. I contact Mueller. What happens next? Right. So, so thank you. Leading causes of, um, of um, construct, construction related losses. I can tell you that what we see most of the time is just poor workmanship, uh, just poor application of product, poor workmanship. And that's where we, the, most of our calls um, come from. Right. So, um, so our process, how do we, once the, we, we, we get called, they said, okay, so what do we do? You know, you come in and, and what is it that you're here to do? A lot of property managers, um, are under the impression that, you know, can, who do I call? Do I call an engineer? Do I call a contractor? Do I just, you know, get the work done in house? What do I do? How does this work? Right. When it comes again, so we're talking about a, a large structure condominium associated building, um, which has a lot of moving, moving parts, a lot of, a lot, a lot of structural components. So we come in and we say, okay, so let's look at the issues um, that if you have a um, turnover report, if you have a five of eight report that another firm put together, if not, we can, uh, we can provide that that type of um, document. But at that time, we provide you with a detailed proposal of how uh, the process works, right? So there's an investigation phase during which we gather and document all conditions, right? So everything that's happening within the building, all the identified deficiencies, some of them, not, uh, unfortunately, they're, they're not, we're not able to determine right away. They're not visually um, available, but with uh, destructive and exploratory um, testing, that can be done and we are familiar with condominiums so we we know where to look and what to um what to recommend based on on the type of construction right so the process is investigation process we provide you a, a proposal with with the breakdown investigation then after we determine what the issues are naturally we go into a design construction document space which then we explain what you know what the repair details for whatever the issue may be 
and we provide you with a set of documents that will be will be submitted to the city for review and approval for permitting. And then after that is the construction administration phase during which you know the work actually gets done, a contractor is hired, and you know if that's what the, the property decides to do. But if it's a, if it's a um, construction defect, you don't want to do the work right away. Rather, you identify it, you document it, and then you turn it over to um, a firm like yours to be able to recover first because of these issues, these deficiencies are not uh, are, are not cheap. They're very costly, and they and usually have recourse when it comes to. Uh, yeah. the developers insurance policies or what other policies that are in place. So we provide the all, all the legwork to be able to uh, get a claim going. Um, and then we, we can go from there. But naturally, the lead, what we see is it's that in South Florida, poor workmanship, poor application of product happens all the time. Um, you know, bad stucco application, that, that's a good one. Uh, post tension pockets, post tension cables, we see that all the time. Uh, sliding glass doors, um, and proper installation of window systems. I could just go on and on and on. Yeah, it's uh, and, and and unfortunately, uh, as we we enter and exit these recessions that we've been seeing, uh, um, you know, first it was the mortgage crash, and then obviously we have the recent pandemic related issues in the market. Um, you know, we're 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 on the cusp of another trend here, right? So we're gonna be we're, we haven't yet to see what's to come. Um, and, and I think, uh, something you, you touched on about the time component to it and as property managers or just business owners in general that are dealing with something like this, understand it does take an enormous amount of time. And I think that, uh, William uh, makes a really good point there, but the other component to that is money, right? Um, the reason why we, the reason why we want to investigate these things is because it's going to cost money to fix these issues. Um, and, and, in most, in most situations, especially for a lot of community associations, we don't reserve for things like this, right? We don't expect these things to happen. Um, and most people don't think that they're covered by insurance, despite the fact that while your own insurance may cover for it, the contractor or a developer or engineer or architect that designed or implemented these systems uh, may actually have insurance that does cover it. But going through the proper means and hiring competent individuals like yourselves is going to lead you to that. So again, as, as we come out of this latest recession um, and we get back to business as usual, um, and we're not even close to that yet. There's a lot of rumblings around going about, you know, are we going to roll back? Uh, COVID infection is on a, on a rise. You know, who, you know, the, the information, you know, depending on the source that you look at, it's very confusing, but l let's project a few, a few months forward. Let's, let's forward think about this and say, how do you think it's going to impact the construction industry and what should managers, property managers specifically be looking for right now if they're if they if they've just gotten into a new project or anticipate taking on a new property, um, let's say in the next six months. So um, before I go into that, what I would like to also mention related to the last uh, the last topic we discussed. So when it comes to money and spending the money, the engineering fees are what are known as soft costs, right? You don't reserve for them. You're not usually prepared to. Uh, to come to come up with the money for the investigation portion Great point. Of, uh, yeah. of claims. So um, so what makes us different, I just wanted to point that out, is that we, we do provide the same services, affordable services, but a at a, a much lower cost. Um, as a local firm, boutique firm here based out of uh, Miami Beach and soon to move to uh, to Coconut Grove, um, it's, it's our cost, um, our, our billing rate and our schedule, which makes makes a little bit of a difference to the communities. And that's why we've, uh, been, we've been successful so far. Uh, we're we're very we're very proud to be affordable and to uh, to do do what's right and help our communities, which is certainly going to help some of these these property managers and dealing with some boards as we we head out of this situation. Let's say in six months, predicting forward, um, you know, what is your advice to these managers uh, in dealing with a situation where they let's say they 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 uh, they take on a new project and. They're right. And, and, and day one, what are they, what are they, you know, what are they looking for? I mean, you've been there, you've seen it, um, both from the construction side as well as the management side. Um, so what advice do you have for our, our property managers, um, that, uh, that take on a new building and the turnover process? My advice is to, to document, be, be detailed, work with all the professionals, um, that are involved. If you don't have, um, professionals involved, get them involved. And, and be very, very involved with the day-to-day -day and make sure that you keep all the documentation in a safe place. What we see all the time is that due to transition, management transitions and transition of management companies or just, you know, the, the course of business, a lot of, a lot of documentation is lost, which is critical to the entire process. 
So if you don't have warranties, if you don't know what contractor did what work, if you don't know what be uh, the origin, if you don't have drawings, plans, things of that sort, it just duplicates efforts and, and it, it all translates into money, right? So looking for mechanical plans, electrical plans, plumbing plans, and, and having to go to the city or actually having to hire somebody to produce them, a lot of these things is, you know, be organized, get the right people involved, and, you know, do your best to, um, to learn and, um, and, and just on a, on a day-to-day basis, prepare yourself to, um, you know, to move forward with, with actually doing the work. That should be the mindset. Don't forget, you are protecting the, the financial interest of unit owners uh, and also the board is relying on you. Uh, to help them and guide them through the decision-making process. Um, as fiduciaries, uh, we got to make sure that we're protecting that, but it, it takes time. And so time and money always goes back to that, um, especially for a property manager. Well, William, I really want to thank you for joining us. It was uh, an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, we've known each other for a number of years now and had a tremendous amount of success um, in working together uh, with these construction-related losses for any number of uh, community associations here in the, in the South the region. Um, I wish you the best of luck with Mueller and Associates. Um, we truly appreciate your town, your time. Uh, why don't you uh, g- give our get our attendees here uh, a little bit of information about how they can get contact with Mueller and Associates for their engineering and construction needs? Absolutely, Dan. Um, we can be contacted online at uh, www.muellerandassociates.org or via phone at 305-647. 2680. The phone number again is 305-647-2680. That goes straight to our office. And if we're not available, it gets redirected to our cell phones. Well, William, again, thank you so much. He's going to sign off, but we're not done yet. We got a few, we got a few more topics we want to cover here today on the a recovery report live, some important information about upcoming events, issues, and we want to educate and inform you. So stay right there if you're an attendee. Again, thank you, William, for joining us. And as we look ahead and we see what's in the forecast as going forward here in the South Florida region and, and up the Atlantic coast, uh, we're expecting quite a bit of weather. Uh, we, we, not too long ago, we were dealing with a tremendous amount of flash flooding issues, and it looks like in the forecast, we're going to be seeing a lot more of that as we uh, head into the next couple of weeks. Uh, so make sure you stay vigilant. We want to make sure that you're practicing preparedness. If you have any questions or concerns, always check out our website under the resource section or contact us at any time to help you through this. And I want to make sure that everyone that's listening in and um, that that tunes in for us to, to learn about insur- important insurance issues that are, that are specific to businesses and community associations. I can't tell you how many times I've seen property manager business owners reporting claims that are related, that are caused by a flood or a water pipe break, but use the same word flood to describe it either situation. And and it's very important because we just dealt with recent flash flooding issues and a number of the claims that came in were reported or noted on loss runs as water losses or water claims. And then we had several pipe break claims that came into our office and we looked at the reporting of them. And here is the property manager, the business owner, putting together the accord form, which by the way, not necessary. But on that accord form, they write about how the 20th floor of the building was flooded. It's very important that you use the words to describe your damages that are provided for you in the policy that will actually provide you coverage. Because at the end of the day, you have insurance to protect you against certain risks or those risks that are not specifically excluded in your policy. But if you're using the wrong words to describe your damages, especially when it comes to the causation of those issues and damages, then you may find yourself limiting yourself or or, or prejudicing yourself from any sort of coverage. And you got to go back and re-explain. And what does that do? It costs you time and money. So it's really important when you're looking at your damages and you're trying to analyze and make a claim that you understand within the context of your policy, what words are you can use in order to report your claim to obtain a recovery. And we're not, we don't want to be in the claims business and we don't want to make an erroneous loss run. We want to make sure we're making claims for the purposes of obtaining a recovery. So and if you don't know what's covered by your policy or in most situations, what's excluded and what, you, and, and therefore what is not excluded is included or covered, then reach out to experts 
this was a great interview with with William talking about you know why you should engage experts to help you with something as complicated as a construction related, but something that we see more often, like a water claim, is really the same. And these policies are only getting more complicated. They're costing you more money. So every day, it's very important that you look at the language that you're using in reporting your claim to making sure that you don't prejudice yourself and cost yourself time and money. So as we head at, head into a very rainy part of the season, and we're going to see a number of flash floods and flooding events that occur, and, and a lot of times a flash flood is a sudden flooding event. That's, that's really what it is. It's a local isolated area, typically due to heavy rain, different than something that you would see, let's say, during a hurricane or some tidal flooding from a, like a tsunami or something like that. This is something where you have an extreme downpour in a short amount of time and the storm drain systems of the, of the, of the local jurisdictions that you know, back up, flood out the areas, cause damage to your building. And making sure that you can differentiate between something like that and let's say something that occurs on the 5th or 10th or 20th floor of your building where, and understanding why that's not, quote, a flood. And if you do have a flood, understand that you're extremely limited in certain coverages that you may be afforded depending on the elevation of, your, of the lowest level of your building, which is your base flood elevation. And it's becoming very, very restrictive. And as early as... Uh, as April of 2020, we saw major rate increases between 5 to 15% in an earlier broadcast uh, that we had done a couple of weeks ago. We talked about that. So it's really important that you are maximizing recovery and that you are, you are making a claim for what you can get paid for, because especially when it comes down to dealing with the federal flood program, if you're overreaching or you're including a whole lot of, it's going to take time. It's going to take a long, a much longer time for you to actually get paid. It's going to extend the process. And when you're, when you're restricted, um, based on a, a 60 day, a 60 day proof of loss window. And that is a time in which you have to submit a sworn statement as to the amount of your loss. You want to make sure you avoid any such delays or causing un, unnecessary delays. And by overreaching or claiming for things you are not covered for, you want to be very specific as a, as to what you actually are claiming for, what you're allowed to get. And if you don't understand it, Again, reach out to us. Let us know. We'll walk you through the entire process. We'll give you the information you can use to help your association avoid the un uncertain uh, outcomes like delay, denial, um, and underpayment of your claim. Any one of those are possible if you don't get it right from day one. Uh, I, the first 72 hours, we've said it many times in this broadcast, are the most important and when it comes to actually the claims process. It's important that you get things right in those 72 hours so that you can prejudice yourself, so that the reserves don't get too set too low, and also don't cause unnecessary delays by claiming for things that you, quite frankly, just can't recover for. So... I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Check out our website, getglobalpro.com slash resources for all things that you may need to help you manage your risk to recovery. You can view, read, download the information. Check out our, our, our YouTube page for, the, for prior broadcasts. For this broadcast, we'll be uploading it shortly so that you can be ready for what's to come. Because quite frankly, in a lot of, in a, especially for the coastal areas, being prepared, practicing preparedness is, is of the utmost importance, not only for the health and safety of your unit owners or your employees, if you own and operate a business, but also in order to protect your property from unnecessary damage. Um, so again, we want a huge thank to all of our attendees. We truly appreciate you tuning in. Please feel free to connect with us at any time, contacting us at 855 487 7475 or go online at getglobalpro.com. Hit the contact us button, submit your information to us. We'll get right back to you within 24 hours. We're here for you 24 7, 365 days a year. Check us out on, follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We're providing you all the information you can use week in and week out. And, and make sure that you tune in, subscribe to our newsletter. We'll see you next week at 11 a.m. Thursday for our upcoming broadcast and exciting interviews with so many important individuals, pillars of our communities, and experts in various different industries like William, who joined us today. Again, thank you to all of our attendees.